A new year, another impeachment trial. Former President Donald Trump makes history as the first president to be impeached twice, as well as the first president who will face an impeachment trial after leaving office. So where does this impeachment trial go, and how does it differ from what we saw one year ago? Dr. Adam Carrington, constitutional scholar and associate professor of politics at Hillsdale College, will join us to break down those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen, and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm Sam Chen. A new year and another impeachment. President Donald Trump has made history as the first president to be impeached twice. And he will also be the first president to face an impeachment trial as a former president of the United States. So as history blazes his path, we have questions. How does this differ from the first impeachment run? What are the charges? And how does the Senate handle the impeachment of a former president? Joining us is constitutional scholar, friend of the show, Dr. Adam Carrington, associate professor of politics at Hillsdale College and the visiting fellow at the James Madison program at Princeton University. Dr. Carrington, welcome back to Face the Issues and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. Thanks for having me again. It is good to have you back. I wish... Uh, it feels like every time we're here, we're talking about some kind of potential constitutional crisis, whether it's impeachment or packing the court or, or something else like that. Uh, but we are grateful for your expertise. I want to ask you from the top of, of 30,000 foot, very general question. We are obviously, this is history in the making. There have only been four impeachments in the history of the United States. Two that will now take place with former President Donald Trump. How does, where does this play in our history from your perspective? And how is this similar or different to the first impeachment of President Trump and other past impeachments? Yes, and you're, you're right to say that in being impeached twice, not only is President Trump, well now former President Trump, history making, no one else has been impeached twice. He's also now responsible for half of the all the impeachments of presidents in American history. And where I think this relates at least to his last impeachment is I think there's one, only one article of impeachment as opposed to two last time. But I think also that the 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 question is a little more focused that last time there was a lot of debate about what are we actually impeaching mm -hmm. for? And it seemed to be a kind of an abuse of power is what was claimed related to his phone call with the president of Russia. But I think a lot of the public was left with a little less clarity on what was being discussed. I think this one, everyone knows about the Capitol riot, the, the, the insurrection that happened there. Everyone knows that there was a rally being held by the president at the same time. So there's at least a little more clarity as far as what's being accused going forward. And it's interesting, therefore, that you had basically no Republicans go along with the first mm -hmm. impeachment in the House of Representatives. You had 10, which is actually a record for all impeachments uh, from one's own party this time. So I think that shows that there was at least a, a considered a more serious gravity and clarity to this one. I remember during the first impeachment a year ago, we were talking about the idea, one of the charges was contempt of Congress. And the idea that what even is contempt of Congress, we know what contempt of court is, but if Congress asks you to come testify, do they even have the authority to hold you in contempt? You know, what, what does that look like? And to your point, this charge is very clear. It's a charge of incitement. Now, legally speaking, what is incitement? And what, I mean, we know what incitement is in everyday language, but what rises to the level of incitement within the context of an impeachable offense. And there brings up a question that was fought over last time, which is do impeachment or impeachable offenses, do they have to be actual legal charges? In other words, do you have to break the law? And if the standard for incitement is that, 
then it's what's considered as speech that causes or, uh, imminent lawless action or pushes toward imminent lawless action. And maybe a good example of this would be there's a difference between making a terrible comment wishing someone's death or injury and actually directing people and encouraging them to go injure or kill someone. Mm -hmm. The former, while wrong morally, wouldn't be considered incitement legally. It's the latter, where you're actually trying to get, at that moment, illegal action to happen that constitutes it. So that's the legal standard. And, and by the way, if that's the legal standard, it's fairly clear the president was, did not rise to that level. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard charge to actually get over the hump on, so to mm -hmm. speak, to actually be proven guilty of. But uh, then the question is, is there an incitement that can be recognized that maybe isn't illegal technically, but is an abuse of power or is something else? Uh, and therefore, we're back to the question of, are abuses of power or dereliction of duty, is that impeachable as well? Okay, so along those lines, uh, I want to ask th th this idea we talked about incitement, the legal definition versus potentially an impeachable definition of incitement. There are others, I mean, we look at the, his speech, and, and they've cited this in the impeachment charges, uh, the speech that he gave at the rally on the 6th. You said there's nothing he said there legally, if this were a, a trial in the court of law, not an impeachment trial, that would rise to that level of incitement. Now, some will point to other speeches. So Mayor Giuliani talked about combat in the streets. Uh, the newly elected congressman from North Carolina, Madison Cawthorn, uh, actually told people to lightly threaten their members of Congress. Uh, do, now, those are not words from the former president. Does that play into this conception of incitement that others speaking at a rally that was his have said things that would be taken legally as incitement? Uh, or do they have to stand alone on those charges? Like, is there a place where someone says we should charge Congressman Cawthorn with incitement and not tie that to the president? Again, the standard would be very high and it would have to be very direct, a very direct, not saying in general we should have a trial by combat or in general there should be, um, you know, lightly mm -hmm. threatening and without distinguishing what kind of threat he means. Mm -hmm. I still think those wouldn't rise to the level of legal incitement. And, and all of this is an attempt to protect free speech, mm -hmm. the exchange of ideas so that we don't resort to violence. That said, if, if the standard isn't merely illegality, and there's, a, I think, good evidence to think that that's not merely it, then this idea of incitement can take on a sort of different life. And you mm -hmm. can say, OK, it doesn't rise to the level of legal incitement. But if you consistently tell people, you and others, and this is where the president also said, that the fate of the republic is at stake, that the election was stolen, that it was stolen in a way where you'll lose your country, where if you'll never get it back, and then to come and say that this is basically your last hope, mm -hmm. and to go over and tell Congress what you think, and to show Congress what you think, that might be not legally incitement, but uh, uh, certainly a lot of people were able to draw a pretty clear conclusion about what they thought they were being told to do. And again, not legally, but then the question would be, uh, is that an impeachable offense because of the president's position and how he built up that case over time? Sure. Uh, I, I want to ask you about a few, few of the things that were cited in this, the, the, this charge, this single charge that's now being sent to the Senate for trial. The other uh, piece of evidence that was cited was the president's phone call with the Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, now a very, very well-known phone call where he tells the, the Secretary of State, and a direct quote here, so look, all I want to do is this, I just want to find 11,780 votes. A little bit later in the phone call, he tells Secretary Raffensperger, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, um, that you've recalculated. Now, Again, Secretary Vassberger is a Republican, elected official, uh, and this hour-long phone call where the president very clearly pressures him to finding these votes, does this, in your mind, does this contribute to the cause of incitement at, at, so as charged in the impeachment, impeachable offense side of it? 
I, I think it does it, to the extent that it shows a willingness to go to almost any ends to try to change what were the certified election results. Although if I were Congress, the thing I would have pushed harder was the pressure that was placed on Vice President Pence mm -hmm. at the rally and then in the storming of the Capitol to not merely count the electoral votes, but to try to send the electors back. Mm -hmm. And even Pence himself said, this would be going beyond my constitutional duty, my clear constitutional duty to try to go against what the 12th Amendment itself says. And I think in, in, in uh, telling people to go against the Constitution and then telling people that they need to protest and fight like they've never fought before against that is, again, I don't think it rises to legal incitement, but for a, a, an officer, the president of the United States, who has sworn to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, I think that that becomes a very serious charge of at least an abuse of power, even if you couldn't prove it in a court of law. And one of the questions that we're inevitably going to get is, well, if it's not legal incitement, then why is it being charged? Why the difference, be and what is the difference between a legal court case, if it's something that you and I had said, versus an impeachment? Right, and uh, it, and some people think there is no difference, mm -hmm. um, but at least for, and I think this is the stronger argument, that there are impeachable offenses that aren't literally crimes, the understanding is there will always be a moment where you could charge someone in court. Hmm. Why would you have the impeachment process? I guess one would be for immediate action, but the other would be to say that there we hold our public officials to a higher standard. They are entrusted with the Constitution's administration. They are entrusted with our votes to represent us as, as a government of, by, and for the people. And therefore, there are ways of acting that while we have stacked the deck against uh, proving guilty, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, guilt for very uh, specific crimes in the in the judicial process, we're going to demand something higher, and we're going to demand more of our officials in that are holding office, and that that's why there are, is a room in impeachment for something that isn't an actual literal crime. It's telling someone that they have been derelict or failed to administer their duty in a way that makes them no longer worthy of that office or makes them worthy of being punished for that reason. And as per usual, that nuance uh, becomes so imperative in understanding what is happening in the impeachment. Uh, Dr. Carrington, thank you for those insights. When we come back, I want to talk about some of the other ideas that were floated, including censures, the 25th Amendment, and so forth. Uh, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. We're with Dr. Adam Carrington of Hillsdale College and currently a visiting fellow of the James Madison program at Princeton University. Dr. Carrington, welcome back. And, and we're talking about the second impeachment, at your point, of a historic and something we've never seen in our country before, uh, a president impeached twice. And you were saying when we left off that this impeachment is more specific and more targeted than the first. Now, the House managers, as they take the case to the Senate, and for a refresher for our, our viewers here, the House of Representatives uh, votes to impeach, but the trial takes place in the Senate. And as the House managers will, will almost serve as prosecutors in the Senate, and as they make their case, one of the challenges is that the Senate, even in the new Senate, is a 50-50 Senate, and you need 67 votes to convict which is 17 Republicans, probably more, because you see some Democrats on the fence, like Senator Manchin of West Virginia. And this is almost unlikely, especially with the most recent vote uh, in the Senate, it seems almost unlikely they're gonna get there. One of the questions that comes up is, why do this at all? Uh, if you're not gonna have the votes to convict, why even push this? Isn't this, a, as Republicans will say, isn't this a waste of time? And some Democrats would say, aren't we getting in the way of the new president's agenda? How do you respond to that? Should the Senate it carry out this impeachment trial? Uh, I think that one thing to keep in mind is that the Senate is, it, it, what the Constitution actually says is the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. Mm -hmm. And there's some different ways, to, I guess, to read that, but, but the way I read it is actually as a requirement that if the House has gone to such a great length to impeach an official, including the president, others, by the way, can, other officials can be impeached as well, that 
the Senate is required as a respect for its co-equal branch, as a respect for the gravity of such a charge. And I think the shall language in my mind is a kind of imperative. They are required to at least hold some sort of trial to do this. And if that's a, a if that's a waste of time, then I think you're undermining what the Constitution requires. And if you think it's a waste of time, the people to actually punish are would be the House of Representatives for bringing the charge, not to be derelict in your duty as prescribed by the Constitution. Is there a sense in which if the Senate could just ignore charges the House of Representatives brought, that it would really turn impeachment into an even more political football than it sometimes is already? I think that's true. And this is where we have a, a deficiency and some people have been lamenting this lately, that you have, if you're in Congress, you really have two, should have two mindsets. You should be thinking as a Republican or Democrat or whatever party you affiliate with, that's fine. But also you should be thinking institutionally mm -hmm. and constitutionally, and those should moderate each other. And there is, a, I think, a great deficiency across the spectrum on thinking institutionally and thinking how to protect and and continue to, to enliven your own institution, whether it's the House or Senate, vis-a-vis -vis being a partisan for one party. Both are good if they're moderating each other. I think we have too little institutional loyalty versus partisan loyalty, and this, I think, would exacerbate it if we were to not have the Senate not take up its duty in that instance. Yeah. One of the other things that was raised was potentially other ways of removing the president. Now, obviously, the president has already been removed, so two questions in one here. One, can you hold an impeachment trial for a president who is no longer there? Um, but secondly, when they were looking at removing him in those, those, those weeks right after the Capitol attack on the 6th, there was uh, the idea of flowing the 25th Amendment and also the uh, the 14th Amendment, I believe, or the the, uh, the 14th Amendment through the third section there. Uh, what would those options have entailed and which one would have been the best option to go with thinking constitutionally and institutionally? Yeah, I, I'll take actually the last question first mm. because I think it lead, can lead to the others. Uh, and I, I, of the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says that those who have been involved in an insurrection or rebellion can be banned from holding an office of the United States, and the 25th Amendment, which can basically put a vice president in charge and remove a, a, a president, I don't think either of those fit this criteria. I think the 14th Amendment was really intending something like a replay of the American Civil War, hmm. where there was an organized actual attempt to fight a rebellion, to fight another civil war. So I don't think, whatever you think uh, of, of what happened on the 6th of January, I don't think this rises to that. I think the 25th Amendment was meant for incapacity. If a president has a stroke, if a president actually goes clinically insane and we wouldn't even know really if that was the case. That would be something that a ca the cabinet and the vice president decide. I think the real option, if there if, if there was any right option for punishment here, is is impeachment. And so that gets to your question. But what about the fact that he has left office? And I think there are some good arguments being made that we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, try a private citizen. We shouldn't impeach a private citizen that the only punishment that is available for that or the one of the punishments available for that is removal from office that makes no sense he's now already an ex-president now what i think pushes back against that though on both counts is one he was impeached while president mm -hmm. and he was not impeached for actions committed while being a private citizen he was committed he was impeached for actions committed while being an office holder so I think those push back against those arguments. And the other is there isn't only one punishment for being uh, that attends being convicted. One is removal from office, but the other is disqualification mm -hmm. and being disqualified from future offices. And that punishment is still very much a possibility and alive since President Trump could run again. Now, again, aside from whether you think it would be justified to do so, I think that's those are strong pieces of evidence that 
uh, the impeachment could happen. And I think there's one last one. There's a practical argument. The idea, is there a way to hold a president um, responsible for his actions when he's in the lame duck period right mm. before leaving? And I think if you take that common sense argument along with the other two that I mentioned, it makes sense that at least this should be an option for Congress to pursue. It almost seems, and to your point, many, including Alan Dershowitz, uh, Jonathan Turley, who's uh, over at GW Law School, have made this argument that as a, you, should, you shouldn't be able to try a former president in an impeachment trial. Uh, but to your point, it, it would almost seem that it would create a, a, the lame duck period would essentially give the president free license to act as, as he or she should choose if there's no threat of, of impeachment or no threat of, of, uh, of any punishment for their actions in that period. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that's an instance where when there's at least some textual evidence both ways, and I still think there's more textual evidence toward allowing it, you also have to assume common sense and wisdom on the part of the framers of the Constitution. And that's one argument in favor of allowing these kind of trials is common sense and wisdom would say there needs to be some way to take care of that kind of situation in case it might occur. Mm -hmm. The other question that has been raised is, can the president be tried as a private citizen now that he's no longer in office? Can he actually be tried in a court of law if there are, is evidence that comes through during this impeachment trial? Um, is there some, I mean, would that, in my mind, I don't, I'm not sure that would constitute double jeopardy uh, because an impeachment trial is not quite a legal trial, but is there something that would prevent that for evidence that's brought up in the impeachment to then be used against the president uh, in, in a regular court of law later on? Someone might be able to try that claim, but likely not. One is the double jeopardy says, clause in the Fifth Amendment says, you shall not be twice put in jeopardy of life and limb, hmm. meaning either the death penalty or being thrown in jail. Neither of those are even an option for impeachment. It's merely removal from office and disqualification. So I think the Fifth Amendment would be clearly out because of that. I think also that if there if something did come up during the impeachment trial, it certainly could be pursued in a criminal trial. But I, I don't think that at least those conducting the impeachment trial should be trying to do that. They should be focusing on the particular uh, constitutional process they're focusing on and leave it to the Department of Justice or or others to pursue that in the legal in the legal realm if that's actually what should come up in other words stay in your lane focus on your job and I think uh, everyone everyone can then you know follow their own constitutional task I think that's great advice and it's back to what you said at the very beginning the difference between this impeachment and the one a year ago this one seems to be a little bit more in the lane a little bit more focused and certainly good advice for the house managers as they make their case dr adam carrington thank you again for joining us don't go away we'll be right back welcome back to face the issues dr carrington again thank you for your time and your insight as you know, we always use this, this third segment here to talk about something that's fun going on in our lives, whether baseball or your new book. Um, but right now, you are serving this academic year as a visiting fellow at the James Madison program at Princeton University, which is a bit away from where you normally are at Hillsdale College in Michigan. Talk to us about the James Madison program. What is it and what do they have you doing there? It's, it's a really neat program that I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of and, and honored. It was started by Robbie George, who many may know for his academic work, but also as a public intellectual. And the idea is really to foster on this campus at Princeton, but also across the country, a knowledge and respect for the ideals of, of the Constitution, of the history of America, and to foster the ability to have sane, sensible, but principled conversations about fundamental questions of politics, what's just, what's good, what's true. And so I, I'm, I'm helping with teach a class uh, this coming semester that's about to start here, working on a book on the judiciary that I, I know I talked about a previous time you had me on, and uh, really trying to be part of what is a, a really neat, vibrant intellectual life here. What made 
made you want to do the James Madison program? Obviously, those of us who know Robbie George know the, the pool and the attraction that he is for a program like this. But what made you want to do this? And what are you uh, walking away with? Uh, what are you getting out of it? Well, uh, certainly a great intellectual community. They bring together wonderful other scholars and students to have just uh, amazing conversations, often outside of my own field. Mm -hmm. There's a reading group here where we're reading Jane Austen novels, which has been wonderful, but also a chance to, it's a sabbatical from my normal teaching, to really focus on my writing and research in a way that wouldn't be possible during a normal academic mm -hmm. year. So uh, both of those things have been great attractions. I've made uh, some wonderful new academic friends and people that I hope to continue to work with in the cause of civic education, developing human beings and citizens in this country that we need to have a republic that is self-governing mm -hmm. as we've set ourselves up to be. Yeah. Uh, it's such a great advertisement for the program, and I think it's so important that we have these continued conversations, um, not just you know here on shows like this, but throughout the country and all of our communities. And I thank you for the part that you play in that. It's an honor, and thank you all for this being such a wonderful place to talk through these kinds of issues. You know, well, thank you, Dr. Carrington. We look forward to having you back in the future. And that is our program for this evening. I want to thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again right here next week. My name is Sam Chen. On behalf of all of us here at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.